I'll hold you a plus until when I'm maybe finished. Uh, uh, before I start this, uh, I just heard this, and, and, and it's uh, something I, uh, I want to point out. Today is the 241st birthday of the Marine Corps. <laughs> and typically, at, at this level of IT executives, there, there, are, there are likely to be a few Marines. Could you stand up if you're here? There you go. Thank you for your service, and I, I have been given to understand that I'm between, uh, I'm between you and dessert, so there's no dessert until I'm done. <laughs> so let's get the show on the road, and I'm going to start this out uh, uh, with a little music so we you know, get in the right mood. And Okay, here we go. Um, this is a medley. Uh, dedicated to the Russian Revolution. Uh, this is about 99, year, this is 99 years old. And if that did not happen, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So I'm trying to ground myself in history. And the interesting thing about this agate prop type uh, uh, art it has a very, it was very strong. It had a very strong impact on us. I still, still today when I look at this and I'm listen to, listening to this, I still, I still have this feeling that I just go want to join the revolution again and you know, fight them damn capitalists uh, <laughs> and storm the Bastille or whatever it was, the, the Winter Palais. Uh, and I got to ch uh, check the picture. Then, oh, I can see it here too. This is Lenin, my hero. He was the leader of the revolution, and, and this is, by the way, Trotsky, who was murdered by Stalin. Uh, but Lenin was a figure larger than life. He was a wonderful person who sacrificed so much what we didn't know and I didn't know, and nobody knew that that was the real face of Lenin, because he was just as a calculating killer as the one we all knew was a killer was Stalin. Um, a few months after the revolution, Lenin uh, ordered, uh, gave an order for what's, what, what uh, is now known as the, the Red Terror. Uh, I can read this Russian, and uh, it, sa it says, death to the bourgeoisie, long lives the Red Terror. This is a, an actual photograph that has then been, uh, been made into this collage. And to... Um, add to the foundation of where I'm coming from. Now, the, the, the uh, implementer of the, uh, the Red Terror, which what that meant was they were pulling out people and just shot them on, you know, on site when it, as, as long as they thought they were enemies of the revolution. Initially, it was about 10,000, but over the course of years, uh, th this turned into fundamentally a couple of million at least. And the, the implementer of all that killing was Felix Dzerzhinsky, who was the head of the Chika, which is the forerunner of the KGB. Now, here's something interesting about what happened to heads of the KGB. This guy uh, died from a heart attack. And, and now, this is a, uh, a gallery of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heads of the KGB between 1924 and 1954. And let's see what happened to them. Uh, this was uh, the successor for, for the, the, to Dzerzhinsky, who died from angina, another heart failure. So we got two guys, you know, too much pressure. Uh, but after that, you didn't need to be sick. When you, were, oh, when, when, when you were replaced, you got shot. The, the next guy got shot too. Come on, come on with a gun already. Uh, and, and they were all bad killers themselves. And by the way, it wasn't just that they were, by, and, and we all complain, you know, as, as executives when we get fired. Uh, <laughs> what, what happens to us, we usually get a going away present. We treat us pretty nicely. These guys, not only were they shot, uh, their entire team was, uh, was done with, and very often their families as well. So this was not, probably not a good idea to to aspire to that kind of a job. And, you know, we're going to stop it with a, 
uh, just a little sad music because he got shot, he got shot. Uh, he managed to survive, probably because he was the cutest of them. And this fellow, he, he lived until 70 uh, years of age and then wound up in front of a fast moving train, interesting. Anyway, enough of that. He, here's my boss. When I joined the KGB, this is Yuri Andropov, who uh, uh, or actually for a while was the president of, uh, uh, of the Soviet Union. Not very long. So now let's go on and you know, put me in the picture. Um, it's my, uh, I'm convinced that the trajectory of one's life uh, is very much dictated by the intersection of time and place where the life starts. So let me show you where I started. So this is a picture of post-war Germany. Uh, this was, uh, I'm gonna point some things out here. This was how Germany was divided by the Allies into four occupational zones, the British, the French, uh, the American, and the Russian. And you know the Americans did a really good job because they grabbed Bavaria and Munich and where all the good beer is made. Um, so, and this is where God planted me in 1949, right there. And the question now is, how this chubby little girl grew up to, <laughs> to, to, be, to be sent to the United States to do damage to this country. And so, by explanation, um, I call this a three-legged stool, the foundation of what what made me into spy material. It's number one is, is character, and number two is ideology, and number three is the, you know, the, the pull, you know, what, what makes it so interesting to, to do that kind of work. So let's start with the character. It's uh, un, unbeknownst to them, my parents did a really good job to prepare me for undercover work. And it started out pretty early. It's a, uh, I have to issue a caveat. This is not my mother, this is not me. <laughs> but I don't have a picture of, uh, of that time. What, what happened was I was about five years old, and this is just a, an indication as to what I didn't get as a child. Five years old when, I, uh, when my mother tried to kiss me, kiss me goodnight, and I said, oh no mom, you know, I'm big enough, I don't need a kiss anymore. And so she turned away and said, okay. And from then on, she would just not, there was, no, there was nothing going on anymore. There was, and I cannot remember a single I love you, a, a hug, kisses, none of that. Uh, what I got instead was Iron German Discipline. I love that picture, you know, German Shepherds. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, I had to be in bed until the age of 14 by seven o'clock, and believe it or not, in, in the summer in Germany, the sun doesn't go down until 9.30. You know, I had to be in bed. You know, I was allowed to read some, but that was, you know, that was it. Iron discipline, um, toughness. Um, there's a, there's a, there's an episode when I had an injured foot, and the wound. I'm sorry about this picture, but you know, that's what it looked like pretty much. Uh, the wound uh, was pretty bad. I came back from summer camp, and my parents made me walk to the doctor, Habel who then proceeded in cauterizing the wound without any anesthesia and then made me hobble back. At, so, and there were a few other such instances. You know, I got toughened up and I got to, I got to understand that you know, I can only re rely on self, right? Uh, and uh, there was another uh, component, independence. You know, the, my mother sent me to uh, boarding school and I stayed, uh, between 14 and 18, I was away from home six out of, uh, out of seven days. So, you know, you see uh, the development of uh, somebody who, who would do pretty well as a lone wolf. And the, you know, the, the, the crowning achievement was done by this pretty girl. She was my girlfriend from 16 to 18 in high school. And, you know, she, we're, we reconnected, by the way, and uh, she knows that I'm showing her picture. <laughs> um, and you know, all the love that I didn't get from my parents, or when, you know, from the, this was my first real girlfriend. I, I invested in her, 
And by the age of 18, when we went to university, she went there and I went there. She sent me a goodbye letter and was over. I was distraught. I was completely devastated. And I pretty much uh, you know, hardened myself against uh, a reoccurrence of such feelings. So you, you put that together and you, you, get a, you get a fellow who can, you can go someplace and say goodbye and have no problem. You know, there, were, there were just no uh, connections that held me back in my old country. Uh, the second leg of the stool we're talking about is ideology. And, uh, oh, come on, move on forward. <clears throat> when I play this, sometimes there's one or two people in the audience who know what that is. This is my first childhood memory. Not that we watched it because we didn't have TV then. Uh, anybody venture a guess? Very good, it's Stalin's funeral. And I was four years old, and why do I remember this? It's because of the music. We were listening to the radio, the Chopin's funeral march, and there was such, um, uh, so much sadness in, 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 the, in the room. The atmosphere, Stalin was a, like a demigod. He, and, and the propaganda was such that when he died, you know, just people were crying all over the place in the Eastern Bloc. And there were quite a few people in the West who were very sad when, when at that time very few people knew what kind of a murderous bastard this guy was. <laughs> and that's a fact, you know, he, he wound up killing it by various means about 10 million of his own people. Uh, that's indicative of, you know, how I grew up and, and how ideology started uh, early on. And then as we grew, grew up, the, there were all these places where you heard the same Message. This is in the background, it's the East German National Anthem. <laughs> uh, so in school uh, and various organizations that I don't want to mention by name, including the, the trade union, uh, everywhere the same propaganda was, uh, was thrown at us, in, in the media as well. And so I, I keep on, I say this, uh, and it, uh, when, when, People tell you, everybody around you tells you that the moon is made out of cheese. You know that the moon is made out of cheese. This is part, becomes part of you know, what, what you know. You, know. you don't question it anymore. Now, what really then sealed the deal, and, and I really apologize, but I have to put those pictures on to make the point, uh, was when we were in 11th grade, we, we were, as high school students, and it was only the 10% of the students that uh, would, would then allow, be allowed to go uh, on to college, we all had to visit a concentration camp and we went to see, we went to Buchenwald. Uh, and what we saw there are these types of pictures uh, and other things such as uh, lampshades made out of human skin that had tattoos on them and uh, also um, um, uh, shrunken heads and stuff like that. It was atrocious. Now, why is there, there is a, this man up here, why do I have it there? This, this is really, this is where the communists actually did a great job in, in, in cementing our ideological foundation. This is Ernst Thälmann. He was the leader of the Communist uh, Party until 1933 when Hitler took over. And the communists were the only party in those days that actually physically fought the brown shirts so uh, he was arrested in 33, spent uh, about 11 years in a, in, a, in a prison, and then what was taken to Buchenwald and killed uh, a few months before the end of the war. So put it all together, we, well, let, let me just go to what the Americans did instead, and that was what I, what I call an unforced error. Uh, this fellow uh, is, Reinhard Gehlen, he was the head of the uh, Nazi, the uh, military intelligence. After the war, the CIA co-opted him and his group. And eventually he became the head of West German intelligence. That was a bad move from a propaganda angle. So what we have here is on the one side, we had the Thermann who was fighting Hitler, and we had Stalin who defeated Hitler, and on the other side, you had this fellow who working on the, on the other side. Uh, so the propaganda was, we, uh, we are 
the successors of the Hitler fighters, the Nazi fighters, and West Germany and the Americans were continuing in the Nazi uh, kind of uh, tradition. And so that was the ideological part of the, uh, the three-legged school, uh, stool. And here's the lure, you know, we, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, number one, I really had ambitions to be like my hero, Lenin, and help you know, the world, make the world a better place. There, we didn't have a James Bond in, in the East, but we had similar characters. And we had these freedom fighters that would go undercover someplace. And there was, in literature as well as, there were some people that we knew from the past. So there, there was a lot of glorification of uh, uh, people like that. And you know, it, it's very attractive for a young person to, to go there. Now, I also knew that I, eventually I would be able uh, to drive them big cars and, and live in nice houses if I go to the West. But it was more important for me to know that eventually I'd be able to eat bananas and oranges every day because we, we didn't have them in, in the East. And I wanted to travel uh, big time. You know, Germans are funny that way. They, they like traveling and I really wanted to go on the other side of the wall, which was, uh, we, we couldn't go there. You know, very rarely would you be allowed to go there. And um, what, what was not part of the lure was money. Uh, there was no big promise to, uh, to, you know, for, for a lot of money. Okay, so there, I had to make a decision. I was at the time when I had to make the decision, I was already working for the university and my dream was to become a professor and teach chemistry. And the uh, alternative was to become one of those postage stamps. Um, and these are very famous uh, KGB spies in history. Richard Zorge, Richard Zorge, uh, spied for the KGB in Japan and did really good work for them. And he, he was caught by the Japanese and executed. And this fellow, uh, Rudolf Abel, Abel, or also known as Eddie Fisher, if you saw the movie uh, Bridge of Spies, he is the spy in there. Um, and so ultimately it became a no-brainer. I had to do it. I wanted, you know, I wanted to be special. So, Let's go a little bit into some training that I got. You know, I, I, I can only touch the surface. You know, if you want to know more, you've got to read the book. Uh, <laughs> so, um, part, I, I had, I arguably I was, was probably one of the best trained uh, on, uh, undercover operatives for one reason and one reason only. My base training was extended for two more years because it turns out that I had a, a, a a talent for English, learning the English language, and that's when I was uh, sent to Moscow, lived two years in Moscow to learn English. But other than that, the training consisted of things like operational training, surveillance. So when you, when you find out whether you're being watched, whether you have a tail, that usually that required a two to three hours uh, walk through the city, taking public transportation, going to all kinds of places, and the bottom line is if you saw the same face within those three hours more than once, you knew you had a tail. We had a, I, there were a lot of uh, exercises that I did particularly in Moscow uh, where sometimes I had a tail and sometimes I didn't. And, uh, and the folks that were, were looking, you know, that were, that were uh, trailing me were like some of the best. They were typically, they would be uh, you know, uh, uh, attached to American diplomats or, uh, you know, uh, visitors from foreign countries, I beat them every time. Uh, the, another one would be secret meetings. Listen to this one. That's, that's the code words I used when I met a resident agent, some, some person who was a diplomat in another country. The funny thing is, we, the moment you get there, the, all the meetings that, that took place at 3.15, the moment you get there, and there's a person standing there, you don't need the code words. You know, it's just like, because you know that's him. Uh, I never met anybody in the United States. Th these meetings only took place in, in third countries to exchange passports or hand over money and that kind of stuff. Uh, Another, another really important part of the training was what's called dead drop operations, which is uh, a, a, the means of handing over material 
not directly but indirectly using a, some kind of a container, uh, passports, money, sometimes a uh, undeveloped film. And, and I'm showing this picture, which is not a spot that I used, but I should have, could have used. See, look at me, I'm coming this way, and even if I have a tail, at this, when I'm getting here, I'm in a dead zone, and I chuck a, a rock or an old oil can into in, this place here, uh, easy to describe, and fundamentally, it's, uh, it, it's a very safe operation, even, even if I'm tailed. Um, anybody been to the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C.? Okay, so there's a lot of gadgets there. It's really interesting, you know, there's hollowed uh, <coughs> compartments. Uh, uh, every time I think about this, what's the thing at, at the bottom of your shoe? <laughs> I have a block there. The yeah, it, uh, the heel. Hollowed heels and little cameras and all kinds of gadgets. I used none of those. The only two things that I used that were sort of not commercially available is this thing is called a one time pad. Uh, the, those uh, groups of five are uh, used to decrypt or encrypt information. Uh, typically, you know, you translate letters into numbers and then do some math on the numbers. And in, in this case, it would be that I, I had an identical pad that, uh, to what was in the center. So, and, and this was essentially, this kind of encryption method is, you can't break the code because it's pseudo-random and there's no pattern to it. Uh, that one, uh, was on a commercially available pad that I, but I had to develop it. It was un, uh, not visible. Uh, the same thing was a, a, a pad that I used that was used for secret writing. Uh, this one, the first 10 pages of this pad were uh, impregnated with some kind of chemical that uh, then would be used like contact paper to put secret writing on an open letter and, uh, uh, and then would be developed uh, at the other end so, and for communication purposes, you know, I used a shortwave radio uh, and I received Morse code numbers that, that I then used in tr to translate into messages. And the other way, it was just regular letters. So the, the um, communication cycle, question and answer, was about three weeks. Well, that tells you something, you know, I had to make a lot of decisions on my own and uh, I learned to just like, I've never been afraid of, uh, during my corporate career to make a decision because I was so used to it. That didn't always play very well. So, <laughs> and, and I, you know, in a crisis situation, yes, but if you get into like a steady state situation and you make decisions like that, uh, that's no good. You know, you need to ask everybody. That's how it goes. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to mention these two guys because uh, these were the, these were, the most prominent people I ever worked with. These were uh, uh, Morris and Lana Cohen. Uh, they were both part of the group that stole the atomic secret from the United States. They were American citizens who uh, worked for the KGB. Uh, both, both of them wound up in, in jail in Britain for, after they uh, did, a, did another assignment and were eventually uh, traded for somebody that the Russians had in jail. Uh, I worked with them, you know, to, to speak, to learn English as well as, you know, they gave me a lot of uh, advice and so forth. What is interesting here is the following, that these two postage stamps were issued by Russia in their honor. It was six years after the Soviet Union came down it gives you an idea that, that the Russian, you know, the Russian post office was run by, is run by the government, that the Russians honor the Soviet spies. All right, enough of the training already. A uh, little bit about spy in action, and I have to go real short because I'm, I'm otherwise I'm gonna run over and I don't want to, I really want everybody to have their dessert. But this may be interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm calling this the, not your typical tourism, this is how I got infiltrated into the United States. 
Uh, look at the travel route. So we're starting with a flight from Moscow to Belgrade. Uh, and in Belgrade, I bought a train ticket for an overnight uh, trip to Vienna. All right, so what I had on me was a, I traveled with a false passport and under a German name. And I had, at the beginning of the trip, I had $10,000 in cash on me. That's the equivalent of about 30 grand today. Uh, distributed throughout various pockets, and uh, that overnight trip was uh, was a, was one anxious moment because I was sitting uh, in a compartment with a few rather shady characters, and and I I was warned, particularly in Yugoslavia in, in those days as well as Italy, to be aware of pickpockets. So I would would sit there the entire night, so like holding my hands or arms close to my body so nobody could get in there, and reading a, a, a novel that I had bought uh, at the train station. Uh, in Vienna, I met an, an agent to one of those meeting uh, ceremonies. We exchanged passports. Uh, I got another false German passport, and then I took another train trip, this time to Italy, where I met yet another <coughs> local guy uh, that was at the north wall of the Vatican, and the, it was dark. Uh, it was pretty scary for me. You're still wandering around in a, fr in, a, in a strange country where I didn't speak the language, where I didn't know how to get around, and I still had all that cash on me. Uh, there I got a Canadian passport. You know, you've you got to understand, now I, had, I always had to learn, who, you know, figure out who I was at the time, because with a passport that came sort of a short biography, I had to know, you know, where I lived, you know, I, I always had to remember my name and a few other things. So now I was a Canadian, I also had to switch languages. And as a Canadian, I, uh, I flew to um, Mexico City via uh, Spain. And after a couple of uh, days of uh, getting, you know, acclimatized, I flew to, I bought a ticket to Toronto, which was supposed to be my hometown with a stopover in Chicago, and I deplaned in Chicago and stayed. Uh, and that's where I made my first big mistake. And there's a few more of those, and it have to do with the fact that the KGB really didn't know what they were doing. Uh, I'm serious about it, because they did not know anything about Chicago, and neither did I. So my, the first hotel that I picked was in the south side of Chicago. <laughs> Uh, I was a standout there, and I, uh, you know, I was still, <laughs> with all that money, I, you know, I didn't even, I, honestly, I didn't even know I, I was making a mistake until much later when, when I realized what the South Side is all about. Um, the plan was, and this was a brilliant plan, what they were going to do with me. I was going to get, a, I had a, a genuine American birth certificate on me, which was, in the name of Jack Barsky, which is a young man who, a young boy who died at the age of 11 that uh, was acquired by somebody who, a KGB agent uh, out of Washington, D.C. The plan was to parlay this into a, uh, a driver's license, a social security card, and eventually a passport. And here's the key. With that passport, I was going to go back to Europe, probably Switzerland, where the KGB was going to set me up with a business, with a flourishing business and, you know, funnel a lot of money into this. And then I could come back to the United States, uh, you know, repatriate the money and, uh, you know, mingle with the people that uh, were interesting. And unfortunately, the passport thing didn't work. Uh, I can't get too much into detail what happened there, but uh, we, we made a mistake with the application. So uh, Plan B uh, got me into IT. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I went, I, I studied again. I studied uh, computer systems at Baruch College in New York City. And I made another mistake, by the way. I became the valedictorian. Not a good idea for a spy who <laughs> wants, to, wants to lie low. And it was just like my, my, my ambition ran away with me. And so, and the picture there uh, is, uh, is of my colleagues at MetLife uh, and me there when I still had a lot of hair. Um, the interesting thing about this picture is that there's not a single person 
except for me, of course, a single person who, who was a born American. They were all from another, you know, they were born someplace else, and neither, neither and of course, I was as well. Uh, I'm going to go past this one here because it gets really, if, if people want to know about what the heck I actually did in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the spying, it's, it's a lot of gray and uh, very difficult to classify and quantify because they never told you whether what, what, you, what you provided was used or of any use. That's part of the rules of conspiracy. So I'm just going to go past this real quick. And uh, for the folks who have seen the 60 Minutes piece, you're familiar with the, what, what I call the unexpected ending. I was called back uh, after 10 years because the KGB had reason to believe that my cover was blown. And so I'm reenacting this scene with a uh, phony Russian accent. This is what it sort of sounded like. This is what I was told. It was, uh, I was approached uh, on the subway platform and, the, uh, and the, the fellow just told me that, you know, come home or else you're dead. Uh, I decided uh, to, you know, be a contrarian and not go home. And the, the reason for that was uh, something that the KGB didn't know, that I had a, uh, at the time a little girl who was a year and a half old and her name is Chelsea. This is when she was born, and that's her with her mother. And I actually, I bonded with this child. Uh, it was just incredible. And it was a hard, a hard decision for, for me to make. At the time, I was really still sort of loyal to the cause. With, it was diluted. My, my ideology hadn't really passed the test as well as I thought it should. But, uh, I was still loyal to the country and the cause, and I would have gone back for sure if it hadn't been for this girl. Um, I stayed, and again, there's a lot more to the story. I, I need to cut this short, and I figured I'm just going to blend into the background, and this is the, the house I wound up with. You know, I, my, uh, interestingly enough, when I decided to uh, stay behind, I opened up a 401k. Before that, you know, there was no reason to because I wouldn't stay, right? You know, I can't take the money with you. Uh, and so I wound up in a rural place in Pennsylvania, and through some uh, defector from the KGB, the FBI found out about me, and they, uh, they actually spent three and a half years investigating me because they didn't know. They didn't know how, you know, w was I still active? Was I running somebody in the government? There were a couple of high-level uh, espionage cases at the time, one in the FBI and one in the CIA, uh, where employees of, of those uh, two organizations did a lot of damage to the United States, one Robert Hansen and one Aldrich Ames. And so I didn't know. So, But eventually, after the three and a half years, they decided to grab me, and this is where they did. This, uh, uh, that was a... That's the uh, crossing from New Jersey into Pennsylvania, just south of the Delaware Water Gap, and that's where uh, a, somebody, a, 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 a trooper, stopped me and told me, that, you know, it's a routine traffic stop. I got out of the car, and from the back comes Joe Riley, who is now one of my best friends, who was the, you know, was an FBI who would like to talk to you. Uh, they took me to this motel that uh, where they they rented. This is a Two wings, they rented the entire wing, and they debriefed me right in the middle so nobody could hear over, over here what was talked about. And then after three hours, they let me go with a stern warning that, uh, you know, if I decided to run, forget it. They had every, every intersection covered, and uh, I had no reason to run. You know, I had no place to go. Where to? The wall had come down. And, you know, I had no loyalty. The Russians wouldn't want me back <laughs> because I had lied to them. They didn't know it at the time, but they would have found out. So anyway, I cooperated fully. And so it turned out that uh, I spent uh, a good dozen years uh, as a trusted source for the FBI. And this fellow, uh, is, you know, I played a lot of golf with him, a lot, over 100 rounds. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, he wrote uh, the afterword uh, for my book. And we might actually do a book together because he got a lot of stories. and. I learned how to write. Um, 
so yeah so 60 minutes some of you have seen it and this is uh, the book cover the book will come out uh, on March 24th and uh, you know there's a lot more stuff in it you know I could really only scratch the surface there are a lot of things that that are funny there's a lot of things where you scratch your head and, and you think that was the almighty KGB whoa you know and I'm you know I'm comparing this sometimes uh, that, that organization was just too big to be good there were a lot of communication issues and and I've seen the same very same thing happening in large uh, American corporations when you know once you get so big you know you become mediocre and it's 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 very difficult to to be excellent as a as a big organization I haven't I didn't manage to work for a large organization that was also excellent a uh, couple of thoughts on on security um, as as we all know after uh, uh, 9 11 uh, security all of a sudden became really big and uh, chief security officers were uh, came into existence and chief information security officers uh, everybody was doing something about security so but take a look what uh, what I'm it's it's obviously it's a it's a little bit uh, uh, exaggerated but you know I can't get too much into detail but your chief security officer is worried about the perimeter is worried about surveillance you know about the physical stuff and and the the IT guy is worried about firewalls and uh, you know access to uh, sensitive areas and so forth. But what about this? Now, those who who watch the Americans know what that picture means, uh, but there's a quite a few who probably don't. So let me point out this lady in that uh, in that. Uh, uh, TV series is an employee she's an administrative assistant with the FBI and he is me he's the undercover guy who marries her and tells her a bunch of baloney that he is actually uh, overseeing the FBI and so she should give him information this is not so far-fetched this is actually these guys that uh, that uh, uh, devised and uh, that, are, that are doing the, the, the series they know their stuff. In uh, the the East Germans were really, really very good at this. What what we call this kind of a method is called Romeo spies. Uh, East German intelligence sent armies of decent-looking young Germans like me to the West, and uh, and and they befriended and uh, not married, but most often became really close friends or lovers of female employees that worked for the government and then uh, operated on the false flag for instance told them you know I'm working for this world peace organization and we need to make sure that there's a balance in the world and you know give us some information uh, they were very successful that way uh, and proof of that is that uh, after the wall came down Germany uh, prosecuted about 50 of those None of them knew what they had done. They were all in the dark, and when, if they prosecuted 50, there were quite a few more. So this, this is part of the insider threat, getting close to somebody who is on the inside. Can we uh, uh, find people like that with a background check? Absolutely not. You know, a background check, as good as it is, uh, only shows you whether there's a criminal history. Now, no good spy in their right mind with a criminal history would, uh, would try to get into a company that does background checks. Um, so that doesn't work. But a little bit of um, alertness might catch quite a few of those folks that they want to do damage. So take a look at this. This is, a, this is a, uh, something that somebody might have caught if they had paid attention. So I was, according to my birth certificate, I was 36 years old when I got a equivalency, high school equivalency diploma. Mm -hmm. And four years later, at the age of 40, I became college valedictorian. I just visited with a friend. He's the only guy uh, who ever figured out says, something is wrong with your story. This, this doesn't fit. And because he was a friend, he didn't dig anymore. But the folks that hired me at MetLife, maybe could have found out. How about the folks 
you know, when I became valedictorian, as a 40-year-old, nobody, nobody asked questions, nobody had any idea, where does this guy come from? So I could have stumbled right there with uh, some, if somebody had been a little more alert in the HR department. Even worse, except at that point I wasn't dangerous anymore. By the way, I, pa I passed every background check from A to Z and I, I, or I worked for five different companies and, and had access to sensitive information at all of them. Um, the, uh, this one is more egregious, except, you know, again, I was out of the danger zone. That happened only about six years ago. I worked for an energy company that owned a nuclear plant. And so take a look. This, is the, uh, this w was the age that I carried based on the birth certificate uh, that I had. Uh, born 1944, but, but this is my real birth year. And when the FBI tried to clean me up in place, so to speak, and tried to make me legal, they were nice enough not to send me into the witness protection program. They saved also a couple of million dollars in the process. Uh, but but they, you know, they didn't want to dis disrupt my family, but the one thing I had to do, I had to change my birth year uh, to the real year uh, because I couldn't possibly be uh, eligible for Social Security five years ahead of time. So I went to HR, and it was two years after I got hired, and I said, uh, you know, I think there's something wrong with my birth date in, in my file. Now, gee, you know, how, how often do you read your file? And so that was the first flag that should have gone up. The, the lady brings out the file, she opens it up, says, yeah, you know, this, this is what you signed. And I says, mm, I don't know what I did there. It's like, this is wrong. And, Maybe, you know, it's a four or nine, and I showed, showed her this uh, uh, driver's license, and she said, okay. The company owned a nuclear plant, and there was absolutely no awareness in the HR department of that, that, that you gotta, you know, be a little more careful with who you employ. I was in the nuclear plant. So, um, and, and one more th thing I wanna say, and that, while I was still in IT, was one of my pet peeves. And I, I think you, some of you can relate to this picture. It has always been my, uh, <clears throat> my position that compliance was very often in, uh, actually counterproductive. Everybody that I interacted with <clears throat> would admit that if you're compliant, you're not necessarily secure, and vice versa. Yet the focus in most companies that, that I'm aware of is always on compliance. Why is that? Because you can check the box. You can actually prove that you're compliant, and if you can prove that you're compliant, nobody will get on, uh, you know, on your case, and you get to you know, uh, work another year. Um, and so I imagine that the Chinese and Russian hackers are sitting there in their back rooms and are wondering, how can we make companies such and such non-compliant? <laughs> that would be really good, right? Uh, <clears throat> what, what I saw is that the effort to be compliant and check all the boxes uh, actually took resources away from, uh, from, from security efforts. And, and Recently, last week, I was at a conference and I heard Dr. Edward Amoroso speak. He is a, an eminent, uh, nationally recognized uh, expert on cybersecurity. He was a CTO at uh, AT&T for uh, many years and he, he, is, he has briefed the White House on these issues. And he took this one step further and he said compliance is actually hindering our security efforts. It's almost like a football coach is handing the opposing team the playbook, and it's always the same place, and so the enemy knows where to attack. It's a little bit uh, exaggerated, but he's got a point. And I wish, and I wish we could, you know, companies uh, often say, you know, we, we are proud to be a compliance-oriented company, I wish we could you know, change this you know, to something like we are security oriented and have a little more awareness of that. Uh, it, this is not gonna go away and the threats are only gonna get bigger. So 
Uh, that's uh, just one of what I wanted to say about that. And guess what? With that, the last second just expired. I'm really good. <laughs> so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm taking questions. We're going to bring dessert out. And but Jack, as he said, he's happy to answer a couple of questions. Uh, so thank you so much. This is really informative and wonderful to get this point of view. Uh, I was like, I've seen this guy before. It was 60 minutes. Uh, so it's great to meet you in person. But if you look at where you were under the USSR and now where we are under Putin, and of course now this is very politically relevant, um, do you think that the level of um, undercover espionage, uh, human resources, if you will, in the United States is more or less than they were under the USSR, now under Putin? I, I think the, uh, <clears throat> there's a, uh, and the CIA has fallen victim to that as well. There's a tendency to rely heavily on technology, pictures, internet, and all the hacking and all that stuff. I believe there is probably less human type intelligence efforts going on. Uh, the 2010, uh, there were, I think, five couples that were captured in 2010. They were Russian, sort of undercover, not really the way I was, but they, they did operate under false names. Um, they were very, very poorly trained. And I, I think the, the, big, the big, bigger efforts are uh, in, in, in hacking and things like that. Having said that, and I don't have the quote in my head, but uh, the, the Guardian once uh, interviewed an ex head of a Soviet, uh, no, Russian intelligence service. And he was straight out and he said, human intelligence is still the most important thing. You know why? Because people make decisions. Drones do, do not, computers do not, people make decisions. If you get into a decision maker's mind, uh, that's a big part of the game. Thank you. Where's the? So I have a question. So Jack, I need to know you're with us. So do you love the USA? Say it again. I can't. Do you hear. love the USA? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I need to know. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Come so on, I'm Jack. Can you sing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game"? <laughs> Take you out to what? <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me tell you something. Um, I went back to Germany three times since I got my citizenship, and. Honestly, 100%, if I had a choice, all things equal, I could live there, I could live here, materially the same. I, hands down, I choose here. And I tell you why. Europeans do not know the meaning of the word freedom. Uh, that's a fact. The, in Germany, for instance, Germany has lived under a heavy uh, government influence for at least 100 years. They're so used to the, the situation that the state owns their children. You are not allowed to homeschool. There are no private schools. Everybody goes to a state school. And there are a few other things. And they, they don't even realize that they don't have that. And I'm afraid that hopefully we don't lose this. Because freedom is, is, is such an important concept as I have found out over time. So that's an honest answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, great presentation. I love it. It's me, here. Yeah, where's me? <laughs> I, I can't see too good because I have a, a light in my... Uh, just oh, you yeah, now I see you. you exactly you're right in front of that. The light, uh, yeah, like an interrogation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you about lie detector tests. They are not, not anything like it. Great presentation, and uh, thank you for sharing your story with us. But going back a little bit into how it applies to what we all do here, and, and the, the, present, the little picture with the compliance and the, the goal is great. I grew up in Mexico, so we often make that mistake. We put the barrier just in the wrong place. How, how do you think we can be more proactive as to where we should be uh, protecting ourselves and without making it so much uh, an art as more to a science? Well, it's, uh, first of all, there's no way that you can be 100% secure, period. 
you know, anybody says that, that's just nonsense. You, you know, you can maybe get 90%, and then it becomes a trade-off. How much effort do you want to throw into this? For instance, I was, uh, uh, three weeks ago, I was at a conference where the head of nuclear security at uh, Duke Energy spoke, and he shared with us how they screen their employees on the way in, and periodically there are psych tests that they're being given, and they, they check references, not first, ref they, they check references of the third degree references, so to speak, you know, oh, do you know somebody else who knows about this guy? And then they ask that person, and, and they do a lot of things that's uh, very, very expensive, but there's a good reason. These are nuclear plants. So you need to focus on, you know, where are your biggest vulnerabilities, number one. Uh, and number two, there has to be a bit more of a culture of like, the, the, I, don't, I don't like cliches, but the see something, say something is actually makes a lot of sense without getting into a situation where, you know, everybody's watching everybody else. That's counterproductive. But, you know, just have a little more awareness. I mean, the example that I said, that I told about the HR people, the, that HR person particularly, that's probably can be repeated all over the place. There is no, we have security of awareness within IT now, thank God. Uh, the other thing, for instance, uh, some companies do that, they, they uh, do, you know, they access, do, do fishing exercises. And if somebody falls for a fish, they get thrown into a, either get, uh, get put on a wall of shame or get thrown into a, uh, a program to, to be educated. It is important, it is, it is important as part of our way of life. You know, we don't, thank God we don't have to be Israel, but you know, but in Israel they, they're doing it, right? So 